the commander appreciates that this training is taking you away from other important work. The intent of this training is to reinforce NAVFAC's culture of accountability. We know that not all of us are in a position to directly encounter fraud. However, we are all in a position to potentially see and report indicators of fraud that we might see in others. This training is an overview on fraud awareness and is an annual requirement. What is fraud? How does fraud manifest itself? What are the indicators by which we can recognize and report potential fraud? You don't have to confirm there is actual fraud before you report it. Make no mistake fraud awareness pertains to every member of the NEVFAC team. Fraud impacts our ability to meet our mission and it impacts our ability to make sure that those we support can meet their mission. It impacts safety, budgets, our reputation, and the support we get from Congress and taxpayers. The focus of this training is to promote awareness and to help you understand fraud and know who you can, and should, contact. In addition to the chain of command, we have our NAVFAC IGs and NCIS to help us deal with fraud. In an environment of decreasing resources and increased demands from our nation, it is as important as ever that we in NAVFAC continually strive to ensure effectiveness, improve efficiency, and eliminate misuse of resources. This information will remind you of the many areas where you, or people that you work with, can run afoul of breaking, U.S., DOD, Navy, or other regulations and laws. This training is not detailed enough to make you an expert but will provide you an overview that will help you, help us, identify and stop fraud. What is fraud? Fraud is a type of illegal act involving the obtaining of something of value through willful misrepresentation. A false representation of a material fact, whether by words or by conduct, by false or misleading allegations, or by concealment of that which should have been disclosed, which deceives another so that he or she acts, or fails to act, to his or her detriment. Fraud exists within NAVFAC. Everyone must work as a team to stop fraud. The eyes of the nation are constantly looking for ways to expose fraud and weakness in the government and we must do our part to find and eliminate this criminal behavior before the reputation of the Navy and our warfighters fall under scrutiny. One of the Navy's and NAVFAC's main goals is to support and defend the warfighter. Keeping bad news out of the media is extremely difficult. Once exposed, it is on its way. And bad news travels fast. Just to illustrate how important your voice is in detecting fraud, you can see that the most common method by which fraud is detected is through tips from folks like you. Over 42% of fraud cases are detected and reported via a tip from an employee, vendor, or other whistleblower. It is estimated that organizations that implement entity-wide training on fraud awareness cut fraud losses by 52%. Internal controls can also reduce fraud by making it more difficult to commit. Checks and balances, in your daily processes, help prevent fraud from occurring. Managers' internal control program self-assessments, internal reviews and audits, detect or deter fraud. Preventing fraud is important because it saves taxpayer money. It is your duty as a government employee to protect the Department of the Navy's program budgets. The most important reason to prevent fraud is to protect the warfighter from harm. Now, just how much fraud is going on? According to the 2011 Gross World Product, this figure translates to a potential projected annual fraud loss of more than $3.5 trillion. As reported in the 2012 report to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, corruption and billing are the top government fraud schemes and accounted for almost 60% of cases. In 81% of cases, the fraudster displayed one or more behavioral red flags. 36% were living beyond their means. 27% were having financial difficulties. 19% had unusually close associations with vendors or customers. And 18% had excessive control issues. As the world's largest buyer of goods and services, 
the U.S. government spends an estimated $2.9 trillion per year. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the Department of the Navy alone loses approximately 6% of its annual budget to fraud. Part of our responsibility, as stewards of taxpayer funds, is to protect our precious resources by being vigilant of fraud and other resource mismanagement. Again, even if you don't directly manage funds or other resources or even supervise personnel, you have the ability and therefore the responsibility to note and report fraud indicators. You are the first line of defense. If you suspect fraud, please report it. After your eyes and ears, one of the best resources we have to deter and fight fraud is NCIS, the Acquisition Integrity Office, and your local Inspector General. The cost of fraud applies not only to large contracts, but also to travel cards, vouchers, purchase card transactions, fuel cards, and similar cost items. So, yes, the cost of fraud is important and applicable to all of us. Acquisition fraud as defined by SecNav Instruction 5430.92b is any willful means of taking or attempting to take unfair advantage of the government that occurs during the acquisition of goods or services for Department of the Navy, including but not limited to the offer, payment, giving or acceptance of bribes or gratuities, making of false statements, submission of false claims, use of false weights or measures, evasion or corruption of inspectors and other officials, Deceit either by suppression of the truth or misrepresentation of a material fact. Adulteration or substitution of material. Falsifying records and books of account. Arrangements for secret profits, kickbacks, or commissions. And conspiracy to use any of these devices. It also includes those cases of conflict of interest, criminal irregularities, and unauthorized disclosure of official information, which is connected with acquisition and disposal matters. We have limited control over motivation, pressure and rationalization. We do, however, have the most control over opportunity. Motivation or pressure, what is it in a person's life that drives them to commit fraud? Pressure sometimes involves personal situations that create a demand for more money. Such situations might include vices like drug use, gambling, or merely life events like a spouse losing a job. At other times, pressure arises from problems on the job. Unrealistic performance targets may provide the motive to perpetrate fraud. Rationalization There are two aspects to rationalization. 1. The fraudster must conclude that the gain to be realized from a fraudulent activity outweighs the possibility for detection. 2. The fraudster needs to justify the fraud. Justification can be related to job dissatisfaction, a perceived entitlement, a current intent to make the victim whole sometime in the future, or saving one's family possessions or status. Rationalization is discernible by observation of the fraudster's comments or attitudes. Opportunity. If one is talking about theft, there must be something to steal, and a way to steal it. Anything of value is something to steal. Any weakness, in a system such as for example, lack of oversight, is a way to steal. Of the three elements of the fraud triangle, opportunity is often hard to spot but fairly easy to control through organizational or procedural changes. Take away any one of these items, and fraud, cannot exist. You are the first line of defense in denying or reducing opportunities for fraud. Supervisors and managers have to be cognizant of staff activities and follow through with the tone from the top. Critical point to be made is that those who perceive they will be caught engaging in fraud are less likely to commit fraud. You won't put your hand in the cookie jar if there is a strong possibility of being caught. Though there are varied ways to commit fraud, the most common schemes, are those listed here. Remember, you don't have to confirm there's actual fraud before you report it. The next several slides will explain the various ways to detect fraud based on this list. The Department of Justice states that, 
bid rigging is the way that conspiring competitors effectively raise prices where purchasers, often federal, state, or local governments, acquire goods or services by soliciting competing bids. Essentially, competitors agree in advance who will submit the winning bid on a contract. As with price fixing, it is not necessary that all bidders participate in the conspiracy. Almost all forms of bid rigging schemes have one thing in common, an agreement among some, or all, of the bidders which predetermines the winning bidder and limits, or eliminates, competition among the conspiring vendors. Bribery occurs when a government employee, or contractor, accepts something of value, in exchange for preferential treatment. An example of bribery is, if money is accepted in exchange for the awarding of a contract. A kickback is an amount of money that is given to someone, in return for providing help, in a secret and dishonest business deal. Conflicts of interest can arise, if personnel have undisclosed interests in a supplier, or contractor, by accepting inappropriate gifts, favors, or kickbacks from vendors and engaging in unapproved employment discussions with current or prospective contractors or suppliers. Personal conflicts occur when an individual is in a position to perform his or her job and make decisions in ways that may enhance their financial standing. Organizational conflicts occur when a company is part of the development or specifications process for a product and another part of the company then tests or evaluates that product. Cost mischarging is defined as improper allocation of cost contracts, or charging at higher rate than allowed, charging to indirect accounts versus direct accounts, or vice versa. The result of cost mischarging is an improper overcharge to the government for goods and services. The False Claims Act also called the Lincoln Law is an American federal law that imposes liability on persons and companies, typically federal contractors, who defraud governmental programs. It is the federal government's primary litigation tool in combating fraud against the government. Failure to meet contract specifications is described as a contractor that knowingly delivers works, goods, or services, which do not meet contract specifications. The contractor may be guilty of fraud if he she falsely represents that the company has complied with the contract or deliberately conceals its failure to do so. If the company has not made fraudulent representations or concealed its acts, the contractor would be liable for breach of contract rather than fraud. Cross-charging, co-mingling of contracts, happens when dishonest contractors submit multiple bills on different contracts or work orders, for work performed, or expense incurred, only once. A contracting official can facilitate the scheme, and share in the profits, by writing similar work orders under different contracts, and accepting the multiple billings. Defective pricing is defined as contractors inflating their costs, in order to increase profits or limit losses. In a weekly controlled environment, an employee with procurement responsibilities, or in accounts payable, or an outsider, can submit bills from a non-existent vendor. Normally, fictitious vendors claim to provide services or consumables, rather than goods or works that can be verified. Dishonest bidders also can submit bids from fictitious bidders as part of bid rigging schemes. Product substitution is defined as contractors delivering goods to the government which do not conform to contract requirements, without informing the government. Purchases for personal use or resale occurs when employees purchase items through their organization that are intended for personal use, such as tools, personal computers, or automobile parts. In other situations, the employee intends to resell the items as part of a side business. Unjustified sole source is defined as a fraudulent act involving procurement personnel who, in collusion with a supplier, improperly award a contract without competition or prior review. 
Did you know that regardless of how well your command operates or how close-knit your employees are, no organization is immune to fraud? That those managers who experience fraud are often shocked to learn the fraud was perpetrated by a trusted employee? That according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, less than 10% of fraud perpetrators have prior criminal convictions? That those who commit fraud are largely first-time offenders, even though the average fraud perpetrator is older than 40 years of age. It is important for agencies to have internal controls in place that preclude the opportunity for fraud. Minimizing this causal factor so that the risk of fraud is significantly decreased. A few details about fraud perpetrators, according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. The higher the perpetrator's level of authority, the greater fraud losses tend to be. Owners and executives only accounted for 19% of all cases, however, they caused a median loss of $500,000. Employees conversely committed 42% of occupational fraud, but only caused a median loss of $75,000. Managers ranked in the middle committing 36% of fraud and had a median loss of $130,000. Collusion helps employees evade independent checks and other anti-fraud controls, enabling them to steal larger amounts. The median loss in fraud committed by a single person was $80,000, but as the number of perpetrators increased, losses rose dramatically. In cases with two perpetrators, the median loss was $200,000. For three perpetrators it was $35,500. And when four or more perpetrators were involved, the median loss exceeded $500,000. Approximately 77% of fraud, according to a study by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, are committed by individuals working in one of these seven departments, accounting, operations, sales, executive or upper management, customer service, purchasing, and finance. The vast majority of occupational fraudsters are first-time offenders. Only 5% had been convicted of a fraud-related offense prior to committing the crimes in the study. Furthermore, 82% of fraudsters had never previously been punished or terminated by an employer for fraud-related conduct. While background checks can be useful in screening out some bad applicants, they might not do a good job of predicting fraudulent behavior. Most fraudsters work for their employers, for years, before they begin to steal. Ongoing employee monitoring and an understanding of the risk factors and warning signs of fraud, are much more likely to identify fraud than pre-employment screenings. Most occupational fraudsters exhibit certain behavioral traits that can be warning signs of their crimes, such as living beyond their means or having unusually close associations with vendors or customers. In 92% of the cases reviewed by the study, at least one common behavioral red flag was identified before the fraud was detected. A fraudster can be any rank from a lower civilian or military member to a high-ranking SES or Brigadier General. Fraudsters are not limited by any boundaries. Commander Sanchez served as the executive officer for Fleet Logistics Center, Yokosuka, Japan, until April 2013. He accepted more than $100,000, along with travel expenses and services from prostitutes in exchange for providing internal Navy information to contractor Glenn Defense Marine Asia, according to the federal court complaint. The bribes that destroyed Sanchez's career and left him facing a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison are valued at no more than $120,000, according to a plea agreement. That includes payments to prostitutes, $7,500 to travel from Asia to the United States, five days at Singapore's luxury Shangri-La Hotel, and cash. NCIS Supervisory Special Agent John Belavo II pled guilty for his role in what officials have called a massive and ever-growing bribery scandal rocking the Navy. Belavo admitted to working inside NCIS for years to thwart his own services investigations into Singapore-based defense contractor Glenn Defense Marines Asia and its head, Leonard Francis, a Malaysian national known as Fat Leonard in Navy circles. GDMA provided husbandry services for Navy ships in Asian ports, arranging tugboats, 
fresh water and fuel for the ships, among other services, to the tune of millions of dollars a visit. Rear Admiral Timothy M. Jardina, fired in 2014 as the number two commander of U.S. nuclear forces, made his own counterfeit $500 poker chips with paint and stickers to feed a gambling habit, and was eventually banned from an entire network of casinos, according to a criminal investigative report obtained by the Associated Press. Investigators found his DNA on the underside of an adhesive sticker used to alter genuine $1 poker chips to make them look like $500 chips. In early September 2013, Jardina was quietly suspended from his post at Strategic Command, which he had assumed in December 2011. One month later he was fired and reduced in rank from three-star to two-star admiral. Jardina, who remains on the Navy payroll as a staff officer in Washington, was never charged with counterfeiting. Instead he was found guilty in May 2014 of two counts of conduct unbecoming an officer, lying to an investigator, and passing fake gambling chips. He was given a written reprimand and ordered to forfeit $4,000 in pay. Colonel James Johnson III, disgraced 173rd Airborne Brigade commander, was convicted of fraud and bigamy in June 2012. Colonel Johnson was fined $300,000, reduced in rank to lieutenant colonel, and retired in September 2012. The fine was double the amount that Johnson had defrauded from the government to woo an Iraqi woman 20 years his junior, and to steer contracts to her father, according to evidence presented at his court-martial. Until his misdeeds came to light some two years ago, Johnson, an honor graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and the son of a retired lieutenant general, had been considered a model officer destined to become a general. Brigadier General Roger Duff pleaded guilty to charges of conduct unbecoming an officer, wearing unauthorized awards or ribbons, and making a false official statement. He was sentenced to two months confinement and dismissal from the military. SES Darlene Druin, former No. 2 Acquisition Executive for the Air Force, was sentenced to nine months at a minimum security prison, and another seven months, at a halfway house or home detention, for negotiating a job with Boeing at the same time she was involved in contracts with the company. In addition, she was also fined $5,000 and ordered to perform 150 hours of community service. Wendy Walters, 47, of Portsmouth, Virginia. Brian Fox, 34, of Chesapeake, Virginia. And Todd Jenkins, 48, of Virginia Beach, Virginia, pled guilty in Norfolk Federal Court to bribery charges. According to court documents, Federal Employee Supervisory Supply Technician, Wendy Walters, was responsible for the inventory and procurement of medical supplies and equipment at the Naval Medical Command Portsmouth. From 2006 through the end of 2009, Walters accepted approximately $19,125 in cash and other items of value in exchange for awarding $450,000 in purchasing orders to various medical supply vendors. Sentenced to 15 months in a federal prison and ordered to pay $19,125 in restitution. According to court records, Todd Jenkins and Joseph James Caffiero were co-owners of a medical supply company, TM Surgical. According to court records, Jenkins paid bribes, in the amount of $5,000 in cash and other items, in exchange for receiving approximately $500,000 in orders placed with his company, by the Portsmouth Naval Medical Center. Joseph James Caffiero, who pled guilty to the charges on May 14, 2010, was ordered to pay more than $550,000 in restitution and was sentenced to five years and four months in prison for his conviction on the bribery charges. Would you recognize or consider that these two individuals were fraud perpetrators? Fraudsters look just like everyone else. If you don't know the indicators to look for, you would not know that these normal-looking people were involved in fraudulent activities. The crime, along with her twin sister, Darlene Wooten and Charlene Corley were the co-owners of CND Distributors, a supplier of small hardware components, plumbing fixtures, and electronic equipment. 
The company used a computerized government system that allowed shipping costs for each order to be submitted separately and automatically reimbursed. Using the system, C&D distributors received payment from the Department of Defense on 112 fraudulent invoices, totaling $20.5 million, in illegitimate charges, for parts sent to priority military installations, including destinations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Among the invoices submitted by C&D distributors were $998,798 for shipping two 19-cent washers. $492,096 for shipping an $8.75 elbow pipe. $492,096 for shipping a $10.99 machine thread plug. $403,436 for shipping six machine screws worth a total of $59.94. The lifestyle, the sisters' spending had included, according to various news reports, at least six pieces of property including four beach homes, at Edisto Island, a collection of ten cars, including a BMW, a Lexus, and, matching Mercedes-Benzes, expensive jewelry, and vacations, five businesses to include a cookie store, and a $250,000 luxury box at the football stadium of Clemson University, Corley's alma mater. The Restitution and Punishment Darlene Wooten committed suicide in October 2006 after being approached by federal investigators. She left behind a suicide note and a check, made out to the Defense Department, for $4.5 million. Wooten's sister, Charlene Corley pled guilty in August 2007 to two conspiracy charges to commit wire fraud and money laundering. In March 2009, Corley was sentenced to the minimum recommended sentence six and a half years, in federal prison. Corley was also ordered to pay $15.5 million in restitution, at a minimum rate of $300 per month. Corley served a 78-month sentence at the Federal Correctional Institution in Mariana, Florida. With time off for good behavior she was scheduled for release February 7, 2015. Internal Controls Mitigate Risk by ensuring that financial information is properly and accurately recorded, and reported, and provide reasonable assurance that potential misstatements, losses, or non-compliance, with applicable laws and regulations, would be prevented or detected. Internal controls prevent errors and detect fraud, waste, and abuse of an entity's resources. Some processes contain many internal controls. If a control is not properly performed, it may affect other controls later in the process. These standards define the minimum level of quality acceptable for internal control in government and provide the basis against which internal control is to be evaluated. These standards apply to all aspects of an agency's operations, programmatic, financial, and compliance. However, they are not intended to limit or interfere with duly granted authority related to developing legislation, rule-making, or other discretionary policy-making in an agency. These standards provide a general framework. In implementing these standards, management is responsible for developing the detailed policies, procedures, and practices to fit their agency's operations and to ensure that they are built into and an integral part of operations. In the following material, each of these standards is presented in a short, concise statement. Management and employees should establish and maintain an environment throughout the organization that sets a positive and supportive attitude toward internal control and conscientious management. Internal control should provide for an assessment of the risks the agency faces from both external and internal sources. Internal control activities help ensure that management's directives are carried out. The control activities should be effective and efficient in accomplishing the agency's control objectives. Information should be recorded and communicated to management and others within the entity who need it within a time frame that enables them to carry out their internal control and other responsibilities. Internal control monitoring should assess the quality of performance over time and ensure that the findings of audits, 
and other reviews are promptly resolved. Navy Regulations, Article 1115, if any person in the Department of the Navy has knowledge of any fraud, collusion or improper conduct on the part of any purchasing or other agent or contractor or having knowledge of any fraud, collusion or improper conduct in such matters connected with the Department of the Navy, he or she shall report the same immediately. Navy Code of Ethics, it is essential that all Department of the Navy personnel adhere to the highest standards of integrity and ethical conduct. The American people put their trust in us and none of us can betray that trust. DOD Instruction 7050.1, to encourage DUDE personnel to report suspected fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement without fear of reprisal. OGE Standards of Ethical Conduct, employees shall disclose waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption to appropriate authorities. Know what fraud is. Be observant. Get involved. If you see something, say something. The information contained in this slide is a listing of the NEVFAC Inspector Generals.